special prosecutor and an MSNBC legal contributor. And Lisa Graves, the former chief counsel for nominations for Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee and the former deputy assistant attorney general in the Department of Justice. And Lisa, you know more about Senate confirmations of Supreme Court justices uh, than any of us. And you've been with us in our coverage of this uh, every night that we've been on it. And I just want to give you the floor tonight. I don't presume to even ask you a question or guide you in any direction. Mm -hmm. I just want to know what you're feeling, what you're thinking tonight. Well, thank you, Lawrence, so much for having me on and, and be, uh, have the opportunity to be part of this dialogue with you, uh, with our country over the past couple of weeks. It's been a real roller coaster ride. There have been moments of tremendous hope uh, and tremendous disappointment in terms of the way the process has been so uh, railroaded by Republicans. And I think right now I have tremendous sorrow for the court and for the nation uh, for this man being put on the court when he is so manifestly unfit for that role. He fails every high standard that's set for that court in terms of uh, impartiality, fairness, trustworthiness, and also temperament. And temperament counts the most when you're under pressure. And I also think it's quite clear that he held his temperament when he was talking to Fox News. Uh, he wasn't screaming. He was screaming at Democratic members of that Judiciary Committee putting on a performance and a performance that was most unbecoming for a judge. But I have great hope that the American people uh, have witnessed this sham that the Republicans have put together to install him on the court and that they will hold uh, him to account. They'll hold the politicians to account that try to sweep the testimony on uh, eyewitness, uh, eyewitness testimony of Dr. Ford under the table. Um, and I think that there's going to be a great surge in activity uh, by women and men across the country at this tremendous injustice. And I also think there's going to be an asterisk beside every decision uh, that Justice uh, Kavanaugh issues uh, in favor of the people who helped install him on that court and against the interests of the American people. I want to listen to uh, President Trump when he announced what he thought the standard of proof should be in this situation, this uh, case, if we want to call it that, in the Judiciary Committee, because we always knew one of the first things I discussed on this program was it was going to come down to a standard of proof in evaluating the evidence presented to the committee uh, by Dr. Ford. Let's listen to what Donald Trump said. Let's listen to how much doubt Donald Trump said was tolerable in this case. I feel that the Republicans, and I can speak for myself, we should go through a process because there shouldn't even be a little doubt. There shouldn't be a doubt. Jill Weinbanks, uh, no one on the Republican side agreed with that. None of them applied the standard of no doubt. Uh, they went with reasonable doubt and gave the benefit of the reasonable doubt to Brett Kavanaugh. And the Senate brought in 22 witnesses to testify uh, about Anita Hill's accusations. And of course, we saw uh, they didn't bring in any witnesses beyond uh, Dr. Ford. And we go, and here's this brings us to James Roach's tweet tonight. James Roach is a Yale, former Yale roommate of Brett Kavanaugh. And he tweeted tonight, he's been tweeting about this kind of thing regularly. And he said, I just heard about another classmate at Yale who reached out to the local FBI field office to describe Kavanaugh drinking a nasty drunk, definitely blackout, and gambling, no reply. And Maya, uh, that's one of what now is, is several people from Yale uh, who had information they wanted to bring to the FBI. Yeah, and I think Lisa and Jill are absolutely right. And I would say it's even worse than we're talking about it right now because they didn't even apply a presumption of innocence to Kavanaugh. They applied a, a presumption that they were going to approve him no matter what. Because, and that point, Lawrence, is the most important, is that they intentionally ignored evidence that someone who was being considered for the highest court of the land may have actually lied to them under oath. They refused to look at it. When they said they would reopen the FBI background check, they tied the hands. They literally, not they, the White House, let's be clear, they handcuffed the FBI. They handcuffed the FBI. So we're talking about a democratic process that lacked all democracy, but it, it didn't even apply any standard mm -hmm. because a standard would have said that we will actually, even if we were presuming in, in, uh, innocence, we will look at the evidence to ensure that that presumption actually applies. They did not do it.
And, and Lisa, uh, Senator Murkowski seemed to accept uh, Justice John Paul Stevens' standard of evaluating this uh, and who would be better at, at evaluating that. No one knows more about the Supreme Court than he does. Uh, but Susan Collins did, it's, it's like she didn't hear a word that Justice Stevens mm -hmm. said. That's right, and I think she, in essence, didn't want to hear a word uh, from him and from others. For her to basically uh, credit, as you pointed out, credit Brett Kavanaugh as truthful because he testified under oath, ignores the mountain of evidence that he repeatedly testified falsely under oath in 2004, 2006, the beginning of September of 2018, and at the end of September. And so he was not entitled to any such presumption. In fact, under the rules of evidence, if they were applicable, he would be entitled to presumption that everything he says is, is presumed to be false and falsely exonerating. Maya Wiley, Lisa Graves, Jill Weinbanks, thank you for starting our discussion tonight. When we come back from this break, if you think that the United States Senate did not 